Like, I, there's nothing it really fine. Size, really, but, yeah. Um, which, well, yeah. Is that you? Yeah. Presenter mode might be able to come up. Just double check. I'm afraid. Uh, no. All good without the. Not too sure why. Uh, should be all good to go. Um, all right, whenever you're ready, I'll just set this up for you too. Well, I know it's done. done. Um, yeah, it's pretty, it's pretty good. It's pretty good. Hey guys, last one of the day. Congrats, you made it. I'm sure everyone wants to get out of here. It's been like two full days, or if you do it like me, you just show up for like half of the last day and get to lunch first. But anyways, um, there's a few faces I recognize, but for most of you, my name is Brian. I'll be doing the Slack lecture on acute care and perioperative management. Um, I've got my, well, that's my name. It's the same on Facebook. You can shoot me a message if there's any questions about anything. I'm more than happy to. Or as my email as well, like Pravik said at the end, if you feel like sending people emails. Oh, I need to click both. All right, so um, as I was just saying before, I'm not sure if you heard it, this lecture is a bit of everything, but also a little bit of nothing. So there aren't really any like matrix conditions that we're covering, but surgical and acute care kind of covers everything at the same time. So a lot of it is gonna be an approach to things and kind of how you think about things. And like Pravik was saying at the end of the last one, kind of being able to live with a little bit of uncertainty and kind of try and read the scenario a bit and manage your way through it. But I'll obviously, you guys are here to do well in your exams and do well in your OSCE. So as much as I can, based on you know what's come up historically, I've tried to include things that are as relevant as possible. And then this is just the table of what we're going through. You may or may not have seen this a few times today. It's just where we sit. So periop is in that group B. There's going to be some questions on it. And then emergency trauma is down towards the end. But um, one of the stations that is very easy for them to do and has come up quite a bit in the past is basic life support. Because it doesn't take much resources and everyone should know how to do that for OSCEs and real life. And then in terms of the matrix, what we're actually covering is those things around in red. And then I scratched out those ones at the bottom because I don't even know what those are, but I don't think they're really acute or perioperative. So the same way that Pravic finished is the way I'm going to start because at the end of this, everyone's going to want to leave. But, you know, at the end of the day, these exams are just exams. It's halfway through med school or whatever it is. Um, at the, it's not going to matter in a couple of years. Everyone's going to get a job that's literally a guarantee for you. And then once you're working, you're going to get references and no one's going to care about what your exam scores were. And what he was saying as well, just don't miss on the easy marks. Walk in, put a fake face on, be confident, shake the person's hand, look in the eye, say, nice to meet you. Pretend like it's your friend or someone in the room who texts you and says, hey, can you come over? I've got a really bad stomach pain. You're not going to say, okay, how bad is it? You're going to say, oh, I'm so sorry to hear that. Can you tell me some more? And, you know, it's been two days of material don't want you guys to be bogged down by any of this. Absolutely nobody knows what's going to be on the exam. Nobody knows what's covered in the OSCEs. You just have to kind of stick to your guns, think of the important things, know the big things fairly well, and you'll be completely fine. At the end of the day, in OSCEs, they want to make sure that you're nice and that you can treat people with respect and you're going to be safe. And then they can test all the weird, obscure things in the EMQs. That's just one market of, I don't know how many papers there are. So don't stress. So I did include this slide essentially just for the sake of it being on the matrix of principle of anesthesia. You have no idea what they could ask about this. But essentially anesthesia, you do three things. You put them to sleep, you relax their muscles, and you provide them pain while you're 
you know, cutting them open and doing all the surgical things. And then on the right here is the causes of what can go, the most common causes of death due to anesthesia and what can go wrong. So anaphylaxis, aspiration are probably the two biggest ones, at least that we can kind of predict is cardiac arrest going to happen, whatever. And the highest risk for these things are in high risk patients, which is the same for really any condition, emergency cases and orthopedics. There's a lot of, um, they're just high risk surgeries in general. And then if you put all the things together, you have an old patient, emergency, high risk, orthopedics. Just, I don't know. If there was going to be a high risk station in anesthetics, I would do it as a NOF because that's exactly all of those things combined. So we'll start off with an EMQ. I'll give you guys a minute to read that over. Let's see it, right? I don't know how to make that go away. Whenever someone has an idea, just yell something out. We'll go for that. D. Someone yell something. I can't hear D or B, but anyways. Um, this is a slightly trick question. It is a difficult question. <laughs> so the reason I include this is I literally, this is, this is on one of the old ones for the, 20, for the year four via, but this, it's literally these principles in an EMQ. I, I definitely got this wrong when the first time I read it. But the things they like to say, so you look at who the risk factors of the station, it is an emergency procedure, so she wouldn't be fasting. She'd have a bunch of stuff in her stomach. Um, then she's also young, so you can assume she doesn't have any underlying conditions. You look at her observations, really high rest rate. Um, there's some sort of acute inflammation in her lungs and her SATs are really bad, coarse crackles bilaterally, there's something in her lungs. So then that kind of narrows it down to, is it heart failure or it did, did she aspirate something into her lungs? And then given all those things, it's the answer they had on this is gastric contents. Atelectasis, we'll talk about that a little bit later because that's everyone's favorite thing to talk about is what is atelectasis. Um, Someone who has atelectasis usually isn't that unwell. They shouldn't have that low SATs. So they shouldn't be in a rough way. Um, the thing people say is it clears with coughing. And yeah, you don't normally have these kind of really unwell presentations. Again, very tough question. I don't think they would do it, but there's a teaching point to me on this one. It is C. The point to be made here is that the only point I'm going to make about local anesthetics is you never use local anesthetics in fingers, toes, noses, ears, and penises because that can, if you hit an artery, it spasms and that end artery will shut off and that body part will die. So we never use adrenaline in end arteries or near end arteries. And that's literally the only point I'm making on that. So then we're going to move kind of through the anesthetics. I'm just putting this here for the sake of completion, just to be able to maybe recognize what an ASA score is. They go from one to five. It's how anesthetics grade, how high risk someone is going into surgery. Don't think you need to know how to do this. I, you know, just copy and paste this in. I've never really seen it. But just in case someone mentions an ASA, you have a general idea of what that means. So then what goes into that? This is a bit of a text heavy slide. Um, this, maybe could be an OSCE station. It's kind of um, one of, if they want to have like a trick station of just kind of a generalized indifferent thing, because you, it might trick people up. You walk in the room, you don't have a presented complaint to ask about other than they're assessed this person's fit for surgery. There's a few things in kind of a surgical history that might be slightly different to uh, just a standard history. Um, this one here, the ample, a lot of people use that in kind of like trauma handovers or like abbreviated something if someone needs to go to surgery right away. But I'll mostly include that because just, you know, thinking about 
what their last meal was, what medications they're on, things that could impact surgery if they're, well, this person would be going for surgery. So running through that, the A, the allergies, the biggest one I put in red that could be, be attention. Um, there's a thing called malignant hyperthermia. It's probably the only thing we need to know about anesthetics. People can have a really bad reaction. They can die to anesthetics. It's quite rare, but it is an autosomal dominant thing. It runs in families, and that's the extent I know about it. Um, we're going to talk in the next slide about what medications can impact surgery, and then just a normal kind of past medical history, do some system screening. One question people like to use is just, can you walk up a flight of stairs? If they can't, they probably shouldn't be having surgery because that's someone with really bad heart and lung function if they can't even handle one flight of stairs, ignoring the fact that they have like a bad knee or something. And then if they were going to ask you about, you know, do a pre-assessment exam, I'm not really sure what that would involve. But I'd, I don't know. I would just do kind of a normal cardio resp exam. See if they're big, that can be a risk. If they're going to have a difficult airway, again, big people. Um, not everyone needs an ECG, but older people, it's probably a good idea to have an ECG. And then if it's going to be some sort of high risk, you can consider asking for blood tests. But for the most part, I don't really know how this would come up. This is one thing they do love to talk about, however. Um, diabetics going into surgery. So first off, the diabetics going into surgery, post-op, they have higher risk of cardiovascular complications, infection, poor wound healing, just from the kind of baseline condition. But intraoperative as well, um, there's a few things we need to think about with diabetics, especially around the blood sugars. It's a little bit simpler with someone who's a type 2 diabetic. Um, as we know, there's still a little bit of insulin function. They don't have that risk of DKA if they're fasting for a while. So with them, really all we need to do is morning of the surgery, don't take your metformin, don't take the other oral medications. If you are having insulin, again, don't have that while you're fasting. And then you keep an eye on their sugars. If it gets too high, you just give them some insulin. It's pretty easy for type 2 diabetics. Type 1, I forgot what I said. But anyways, for type 1 diabetics, that's a little bit more tricky because they are going to be fasting overnight and they normally have their you know, insulin regime laid out throughout the day. If someone's fasting, you definitely don't want them giving them their short-acting boluses, so no Nova Rapid or anything that's going to crash their sugars because that's obviously bad. And you also don't want to have a prolonged fast. So that's why all patients with diabetes should be first thing on a morning list if possible. And then if it is going to be a longer or trickier operation with a type 1 diabetic, what they would do intra-op is give some sort of IV fluid with glucose as well as giving insulin at the same time. So you have a little bit of insulin to make sure you don't have that risk of DKA, but then you're also giving sugar so you don't crash and have a hypo. So you're just kind of balancing insulin and sugar both at the same time to keep them right in that nice middle range. And I think that's probably the extent of that. Again, don't think we need to know much on this exact topic, but have a general idea of what medications we want to be wary of with someone who's going into surgery. And I think it's pretty intuitive that blood thinners are going to be, you know, a bit tricky. With the antiplatelets, even just aspirin, I guess one thing to say before all of this is there's no hard and fast rules of any of the things. It's all going to be a kind of you have to weigh up the risk of bleeding during surgery versus the risk of the underlying risk that patient has of clotting. So they're obviously on a blood thinner for a reason. So if someone's like one week post AMI, you're probably not going to stop all of their medications a week out. The cardiologist might, you know, play a little more safe and, you know, say, oh, we can probably tolerate a bit of bleeding risk. But anyways, the general rules with antiplatelets, you see them a week prior because they're longer lasting. They take a little while to wash out. Warfarin is the tricky one that everyone loves to ask about. If it's a routine surgery, you cease that five days in advance, it washes out of the system, no problems. If it's you know the next day or two days, that's when you can vitamin K. So vitamin K reverses that, but it does take a little bit more time to replenish those clotting factors. It's not give someone vitamin K, they're completely fine, the warfarin's gone. 
if you need to do that, that's when you need to give them fresh frozen plasma with some clotting factors in it. If there's some sort of emergency case, that person who's on warfarin needs to go to theater right now. And then this is the reason why a lot of people are hesitant to start NOAX is that they do take a couple of days, maybe three days to wash out of the system. But if there is an emergency, it's not very clear what to do to get rid of them quickly. So I think that's a bit of a contentious thing. I don't know anything about it other than it's probably not great. And the other one I didn't even think about until I was making this table is that the OCP or any other estrogenic medications, um, there is a small risk of forming clots with that. So if the person is already high risk for clotting, or if it's just you don't want to have any risk of clotting whatsoever, the washout period for the pill is actually a month. And then the other class of medications I'll just briefly mention is anything that's going to affect the kidney or electrolyte levels, just don't take them the morning of, and that's probably about it. Another quick question. say so this is the probably the most important point out of that last slide diabetic patient put them first then i think someone said b um i think once they're out of surgery they're probably pretty safe to start pretty much right away i'm not actually going to bother talking about this i just threw it in there because a lot of people well it could potentially be an oski station um, for any kind of consent someone to surgery, consent someone to a procedure, it's good to have some sort of framework. So when you go blabber at that same patient, you don't want to just be kind of, you don't want to show that your mind is going all over the place. Try and have some sort of logical framework you can work through. This is the one, I guess I'll preface this. I absolutely hate mnemonics and hate these things, but this is one of the few that actually sticks in my brain and I actually kind of use it. So that, this one's IP Brad, those uh, Ben Amberg notes a lot of people use. He's got a different one called iWeb race car. Doesn't really matter. Just try and have some sort of consistent framework for any kind of consent or counseling station. All right, so now we're gonna move into the person's, we've assessed them for a theater. They're probably okay. Um, they're diabetic, we put them first thing in the morning. We watch their sugars, now we're post-op. Kind of talking about what happens after that routinely and then after we talk about routine care i'll talk a little bit more about the the complications the fevers the dvts all the stuff you guys actually want to hear about the only point i'm really making on this slide is that urine output is something is difficult to remember about in oskies and kind of in real life i guess but it is very important especially in oskies i think in one of those earlier slides you don't have the luxury of looking at the person being like, oh, they've got a catheter. And you have to actually make, go to your way to ask for all these things. So urine output in terms of a surgical station is going to be quite important. Again, this is more for the sake of completeness. I don't think we need to know any intricate details of how to manage fluids for someone, but fluid management's there. So I just put three quick points. If they're shocked, they need fluids quickly. That's not only just normal saline, that's completely safe. And then the other two considerations with fluids is they're gonna need some sort of maintenance fluid if they're nailed by mouth. You can't just let someone sit there for 24 hours and not have any intake. They need water, salt, chloride, potassium, and glucose. So does any combination of fluids that gives you those things, it doesn't really matter. There's no hard, fast rules. And then that's on the next slide actually. And the other kind of notable exception to make is that no one uses albumin. It gets talked about, but only in the sense of people saying exactly that. No one ever uses albumin every more, anymore, except after an acidic tap, because that's very protein rich. You need to replace that. And then the third thing to think about with fluids is this, if there's some sort of ongoing loss from vomiting, diarrhea, you need to give fluids to replace all those things too. So your fluid balance chart should include what's coming in, what's going out, and then you should try and you know fiddle with all your fluids to make sure that's about normal. 
and maintenance for about an adult is about two liters a day. So it's actually not a whole lot. So this is pretty much the opposite of what I just said, but <laughs> if someone is getting an ascites drain, what do they need? Albumin. This is the only person who needs albumin. Someone who's getting their ascites drain. Then again, um, there could be a question about blood products and kind of what to do. There's a few different ones. There's whole blood, which is, you know, your typical thing. You go donate blood, you have a bag of blood, someone's bleeding, you give them blood. That's what we think about. But there's a few other ones. Fresh frozen, fresh frozen plasma, that's got all your clotting factors. So like I said, with someone who's on warfarin and they're inhibiting all those clotting factors, you can give them that. Or someone who's bleeding or someone who's got hemophilia, they need clotting factors. Then you can also just give people platelets as well. I guess the kind of take home point of this slide is that we try and avoid giving people blood if they don't need it. So there are complications with blood. Um, I've heard people use the analogy of think about giving someone blood the same way you would think about giving someone an organ transplant because it is at the end of the day, essentially that you're taking someone else's material, putting into that person. So, you know, take that with the same kind of grain of salt as you would an organ transplant because it is a foreign, substance you can get an acute reaction to it similar to anaphylaxis or and then that can progress to the point of that becoming a hemolytic reaction and that person can be really sick hemolyzing all their blood cells and then this is more for the kind of old person with bad baseline function there is a small but significant risk if you give someone fluid or sorry not fluid if you give someone blood when they don't necessarily need it it's quite a large volume so if you're giving them too much blood and they don't really need it, you can overload their lungs, which is called a transfusion-related acute lung injury, or you can shut their heart down, put them into heart failure. And then the general kind of cutoff loosely is under 70 is when someone think about getting a transfusion. But if it's non-urgent, you can do things like iron infusions, tend to be a lot more popular. I think I've got a question on blood quickly. Yeah, B. So I'm, I'm throwing up kind of hard questions on purpose. So I'm, I gave you the rule and then I'm showing the question of how the acceptance of the rule might be tested. So this lady, she's got, she's got colon cancer. She needs the surgery. Um, she's losing blood. It's dropped 30 points. 58 is too low for a major surgery. The cutoff is about 70. So she needs that blood before the surgery and then hopefully Everything's fine. So aside from bleeding and fluid loss, the other important thing to think about post-op is pain. Um, this is the WHO pain ladder. And pretty much for any station, we should be thinking about giving pain relief, whether it's kind of surgery, acute care or not. Again, in OSCE is one thing we always forget about. We need to get people pain relief because the patient doesn't look like they're in pain, even though they've told you they've given us a, a number out of 10. It's, maybe it just looks nice if you are thinking about them actually being in pain. But the general step up rules, you start with simple analgesia, Panadol first pretty much for everyone is very safe, or NSAIDs, or you can kind of alternate them back and forth. And then the step up from that is to what are called mild opioids or weak opioids, which is essentially codeine, the other one in that category is tramadol, but they're both kind of tricky to use. And then the third step up from that is your strong opioids, which is all the morphine equivalents. 
which in terms of us, they're pretty much all identical. They're at morphine or endone or buprenorphine or fentanyl or whatever it is. At the end of the day, they all get metabolized to morphine in the system. It's just how potent they are, what the side effects are. So just think Panadol or NSAIDs, codeine, and then the opioid drugs. And at any point along that ladder, you can still keep giving Panadol or NSAIDs. And then the two aims of pain control are you want to keep kind of a, a baseline rate. So you want to stop, you want to prevent pain from happening in the first place. And then you want to have some sort of strategy. So when there is breakthrough pain coming through, you have a strategy to address that breakthrough pain. So you kind of use all these things in combination, but follow that ladder up. And then this table is basically the exact same thing of kind of what types of pain we use the different pain medications for. No susceptive pain is like surgery, acute pain, paracetamol and NSAIDs for mild pain, and then the morphine equivalents for severe pain. And then this down here as well, they love testing which patients can't have NSAIDs. And I think if anyone's at Monash, Rebecca's a renal physician and she rans on about how much she hates NSAIDs because they're not great for your heart. They're not great for your kidneys. They're not great for your blood pressure. They're bad for bleeding risk. They're bad for gastric irritation, but they work okay for pain. And then the next thing after someone has a surgery, we've got fluids, pain, and then nausea and vomiting. This is a bit of a, I've seen a few questions on old exams where it's not really clear what they want you to do. Um, I think I just stuck to the, the safe bets on things. In terms of specifically post-operative nausea and vomiting, the only one that's actually well studied is on Dancitron. On Dancitron is pretty much always first line. There aren't really any indications to on Dancitron. And then you can also consider prophylaxis for people who are at higher risk of post-operative nausea and vomiting. So these four things, a young female non-smoker with a history of motion sickness. So if you see those four things in a stem, the answer is probably going to be on Dancitron, although it's a little bit, yeah, tricky sometimes. And then other procedures that might be leaning more towards kind of a nausea question. We know the procedure, but if someone's got opioids on board, they're quite nauseating. If someone has nitrous oxide or volatile anesthetics, like the laughing gas, those make you puke. Some kid on pediatrics puked on me because he had that. I wasn't too happy. <laughs> and then if anything's in the stomach, laparoscopic approach, you're pumping them full of gas. It doesn't feel great afterwards. And then that's the same for anything gynecological as well. It can make people quite nauseous. And then this I stole from one of the um, Vespa things for fourth year in terms of GP nausea and vomiting. There are a whole lot of options and there's some slightly different indications for them. Um, the one here I'm going to highlight, uh, metoclopramide and domperidone, those are dopamine based ones, whereas on Danzatron is a serotonin based medication. Um, it might be good to know that the dopamine-based ones we don't use in Parkinson's because Parkinson's, you have issues with dopamine and dopaminergic circuits already. And these ones are prokinetic agents. So if someone's got a bowel obstruction, which they also love testing about, um, metoclopramide or domperidone, those are both contraindicated or anything like Senna as well that's going to try and push things through the GI tract. If someone's got an obstruction, that's bad news. So then we're moving on to one of the other things that can go wrong, but hopefully we can prevent them. That is DVT or PE, which is under the umbrella term of venous thromboembolism, VTE. So everyone loves asking about Virchow's triad, stasis, vessel wall injury, and hypercoagulable state are the kind of three things that put you at a high risk for a thrombus event. And if you think about surgery, you're doing all three of those things kind of by definition. You're cutting, you need to keep someone still, you need to cut them open. That's going to, you know, irritate things a lot. So people post surgery are at a quite a high risk. But 
for anyone to, no matter what the procedure is, you want to kind of, you know, start with the simple things for all patients, which being good hydration, early mobilization, and then everyone's going to get that. But then if you look at the list of who these high risk patients might be, then you want to define whether they're high risk or they're low risk. So if you meet any of these things, they're probably in the high risk category. And then I'll show you in a second of some of the surgical risk factors for what's a high risk kind of surgery. And then in general, you want some sort of mechanical prophylaxis for pretty much anyone, no matter what the surgery is, because essentially that's all just, that's putting TED stockings on. That's not really, there's no real contraindications to that. And it's pretty easy, it's pretty simple. But then if they're at a high risk, you might consider adding on some pharmacological things, which we'll talk about in a sec. There's also a really good flow chart at the end, three slides from now, about exactly what things you follow the flow chart and it tells you what to do, although it is quite busy. And then if you were gonna write an EMQ or an OSCE about who would be a high risk for venous thromboembolus after surgery, hip and knee replacements are the highest risk pretty much of any category and they need kind of everything. Whatever you can do, throw it at them. And then trauma surgery makes sense as well. That person's pretty bunged up. They're gonna be at a high risk for pretty much everything. And then again, orthopedic, abdominal and gynecological th surgery, and any kind of prolonged surgery, and those are all higher risk. So then what exactly can we do? Like I said, in general, you wanna, for most people, start with mechanical, that's TEDS, and then the step up from there would be the intermittent pneumatic compression. Um, you can do that intraoperatively. I'm not sure if some of you have seen that. It's kind of weird. It's just like these things that squeeze their legs and they're on the ward. They just squeeze their legs. The only contraindications of those are if you've got some trauma or some reason why you can't squeeze someone's legs or if they've got severe arterial disease. You don't want to squeeze their leg and then lose their foot, which is obviously bad news. So for pretty much all people, except for people with severe peripheral arterial disease, they're gonna get mechanical head stockings. But then only, only people kind of in that high risk category would get Clexane post-op. So again, that's people who are getting orthopedic surgery, abdominal surgery, or kind of a high risk patient with some sort of underlying kind of clotting disorder. In general, Clexane can be used for most people. Um, the only kind of, well, obviously, if you're gonna use some sort of anticoagulation, you're gonna make, have to know who can be anticoagulated. So if they tell you this person's at a high risk of bleeding, um, they've got a history of bleeding, they've got active bleeding, they've just had a stroke, probably don't, that's, that's the person you don't wanna be giving blood thinners to, which probably isn't new information. And then the other kind of one is, even if they're not a high risk patient, anyone after neurosurgery probably shouldn't be getting any clexin or blood thinners because even a small bleed in a small space can be really bad. So neurosurgery would probably be leaning more towards mechanical only and keeping a really close eye on them. I'm not sure what to do with this. Oh, you can't see that. Apparently this is ending in 10 minutes. Oh shit, it's ending in 10 minutes. Okay, cool. So this is that flow chart I was talking about. It's busy, which is why I split it up into a couple slides, but you can literally look at it. Who is my patient? Find them here, then follow the arrow across. But at the end of the day, almost everyone is getting mechanical and less contraindicated. And if they're one of those high risk orthopedic 